Good morning, everybody. Well, man, what an exciting day here in Kansas City. I got my KC red shoes on. I got some socks on, too. Um, they are my second team. I'm still a Bears fan, but uh, I did get some red on my feet. But it's a good morning. It's a good morning here in Kansas City. And um, obviously for our city, uh, just to be able to have these wonderful moments. And I, I love it, too, because no matter where you're at and backgrounds, you're in a, in a store, it's like, like your family. Like, hey, what do you guys think about the Chiefs? What, how do you think they're going to do? I'm like, I don't, I don't even know you. Like, we've never talked. You didn't even say hi to me. You just went right into your Chiefs talk. But, uh, but it's a great time. And I love the fact that as a city and as a people, we are just getting used to winning. Huh? I, I love it. We're just getting used to winning. We, we're getting used to getting to be able to watch our team in the month of February. And I think, you know, for a lot of us, maybe some of you in this room, maybe those watching, some of you need a good dose of that winning mentality just to, to know what it feels like to win, all right? Like to be winners. Some of you got to kind of look at your life and say, no, I'm getting tired of losing. I'm getting tired of losing. I'm getting tired of losing in my relationships. I'm getting tired of losing in my finances. I'm getting tired of losing just in maybe in my job. I'm getting tired of losing with my own personal struggles, with my flesh, with the powers of darkness. You got to sometimes just get, I'm getting tired of losing. And be the people that say, you know, I like winning. I personally, I don't know about you, I like to win. I don't like to lose any. I don't, if me and my wife are walking somewhere, I don't like to lose. All right? I don't care what we're playing in our family. I don't like to lose. I got four boys, and they get faster than me. They're quicker than me. But I remember the first time I lost going one-on-one. -on -one. I got my son Isaac back there. I remember the first time I was back there, and I lost one-on-one -on -one in the back playing basketball. It was one of the worst days of my life. <laughs> I had to keep a good face, you know, like, good job, son. Uh, that's wonderful. You're really getting good. You know, and then you just walk inside, like, what happened? Why do my knees feel this way? Why can't I jump anymore? Why am I tired? Why do I feel like I, you know, need a, one of those oxygen masks? What's going on? <laughs> like, I, I don't care that he's 15 years old. I do not, whatever just happened there, I do not like that moment. I gotta get tired of losing, right? I mean, I wanna try this other thing. I, to quote a former president, he said, you know what, you don't know win so much that you get tired of winning. Have you guys heard that quote? If I get elected, he said, I, we're going to win as a nation so much that you don't get tired. We're going to win. Everybody, we're going to win. We're going to win. We're going to win. We're going to win so much you don't get tired of winning. I don't know if I'm ever going to get tired of winning, but I want to try that. I mean, some of you got to get tired of losing. Some of you are too comfortable with that feeling. You're too comfortable. Man, eh, I lost again. But to get tired of winning, I, 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 I thought about that quote. It's a funny quote. It's a classic quote from him. Uh, I'm like, I don't know if I would. I don't, I don't know if I'd get tired. I mean, I mean, I feel like as a Chiefs fan, we're probably getting there. We're like, oh, we're kind of getting tired. I don't want to speak too much because we got a big game, and I don't want to. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves a little bit on this. But, uh, but we are the people that we need to become winners. And if you look at winners, they always—I don't care what realm that you're looking at, what area—they always face uh, adversity and challenges a little bit different than losers. See, when people are winners, they are the kind of people, and this is what we need to become, that are not moved by every storm. They're not blown over by every storm and every wind that comes their way. Be the people of God that are not always being discouraged by every little setback. We watch, all you guys are watching, particularly the ones that got red on you, watch the games, right? One thing I like about our quarterback is he throws an interception or does something not great. You don't see him just, oh, I don't know, probably not going to win the game. 
oh no, I'm just going to go over here and sit down. Oh God, someone help me, I don't know what to do. Like, that, that's not how he's facing adversity, right? And sometimes as the people of God, we get a little bit of a setback. Something don't quite go our way. We have a little bit of a financial setback. Oh, that tithing thing, it just doesn't work. You know what? Maybe I should just quit my job. Maybe I should just, nothing works for me. I'm always, and it's just an attitude. By every little discouragement that comes our way, we're, we, we gotta begin to remind ourselves who we are and who we belong to. We gotta remind ourselves that we are the people of God, that we are walking in the favor of God, we're walking in the goodness of God. We are the people that are in Christ. That there was blood spilt for each one of us. We've been purchased. Remind yourself, you've been redeemed from the curse. You've been redeemed from always losing. Hopefully that's good news for somebody. And this morning, I want to do this. I want to declare over our congregation. I want to declare the favor of the Lord over your life. I want to declare victory in your life. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what situation. But I want to declare. I want to prophesy. I want to proclaim. I want to preach. I want to preach that favor into your life, that victory into your life. Listen, we are the people of God. I want to proclaim right now the goodness of God. The goodness of God in your life. Despite what it might look like, I want to proclaim his goodness, his life. I want to proclaim that this is the year of the Lord's favor. This is the year of his goodness. And I'm the, I want to come in, I was, I'm fired up. I mean, I'm going to expect these boys to put their best effort, and I'm not going to mail it in on a Super Bowl Sunday, all right? I'm here to preach, all right? But I want to declare this. A season of victory in some of your lives. A new season of victory. A new season of redemption. A season of jubilee. The year of jubilee. You know what that was? Every 50 years, they'd have the year of jubilee. It means that they would blast the horn. That shofar, they'd blow it. And all the captives would go free. All the prisoners would go free. There would be a release of all indebtedness. If they had debts, they would be wiped off. They would have land that was taken from them, was given back. They would rest the land. It was a season of favor. It was a season of, of all the captives. If they were got indentured servants, they were released. If they had to give up some of their land, it was given back to them. It was a time of universal redemption that would happen. And I'm proclaiming for some of your lives, you got to believe this, a new season. Can you believe that for your life? A new season for our church, for your family. A season of favor, a season of victory, a season of jubilee. And in that season, begin to expect some things. To expect Expect. Don't let your past seasons prophesy your current season. Don't let your past season dictate what you're expecting this season. Why do you think newbies in the things of God, why they do so well? Because they don't have the past sometimes. And some of us have been around for a while like, yeah, I tried to pray that. I tried. I fasted that. I didn't get that. And we start to allow previous seasons to dictate our current season. And I'm telling you, listen, and as we walk in to this new season, the season of Jubilee, to begin to expect, believe, right? Expect favor on your life. Expect the goodness of God in your life. Expect freedom to come into your life. Okay, expect that you're going to start winning over darkness in your life. Expect that you're not going to continue to lose to your flesh. It's a season of expectation. Expect to walk with God. Expect to have a future with God. Right? Expect to have that anointing and that purpose. Expect to win. Expect to win. I guarantee you the two teams today they are both expect. They're not in the Super Bowl because they don't have this mindset. 
I don't care what level. People that win expect to win. They expect it. I expect to win with my marriage. I don't ever, ever have a thought that one day something will crumble. I expect to win. I expect to continue to become a better and better husband for my wife. All right, I expect that we will never have lack. I'm never going to beg for bread. I'm a child of God. That's my expectation. We're always going to have enough, Jill. Always. I expect to be anointed. I expect to have the favor of God in my life. I expect to have his presence. These are just expectations that I have. I don't think of anything else. I don't think of just playing defense. I hope, I hope my marriage makes it home. That's not my mentality. I want to be on the offensive, right? I want to win. And as I was thinking about this and as I want to continue to declare this, I want to speak over you. Isaiah 61 is something I've been stirring in me for like six to seven months. I preached some of this up at Revive Chicago. I've been waiting to just speak this into this congregation. Some of my friends, I've been speaking this. And I want to declare this. I want you, as I speak, I want you to receive some things here. You guys all know this, and I'm already preaching. I have a little rookie voice up here. Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, right? To proclaim freedom to the captives and release from darkness the prisoners. To what? Proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. To proclaim it. It goes on and talks about the vengeance of our God. I'll leave that off because Jesus did. But it goes on and says this. To comfort all those who mourn. To provide for those who grieve in Zion. To bestow upon them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. The oil of joy instead of mourning. The garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. <laughs> That's what I want to proclaim and declare over all of us here today. If you're poor, you don't have to be poor no more, right? If you feel like your life has just been in captivity, you got bondages and strongholds, and like darkness has been winning, listen, I'm here to proclaim freedom to the captives. You don't have to lose to that thing anymore. That thing that's been tormenting you, hounding you, binding you. Listen, there's freedom for the captives. You've been in mourning. Guess what? He said, I'll come and comfort you. I'm going to replace that mourning with an oil of joy. I'm going to bind up the brokenhearted. To comfort all those in mourn. Some of you have been feeling despair. Come on, you need to receive a garment of praise this morning. A garment of praise. To begin to think about your future a little different. Yeah, I know you might have had despair. I know you have gone through some setbacks. But listen, that's what he's declaring. That's what I'm declaring to you. That you don't have to stay there. You don't have to stay there. You don't have to have that thing sit over you. That don't have to be your identity. That doesn't have to be your future. It doesn't have to be. This morning, some of it's time to get out of that rut. Some of you got to just stop just going around that old mountain once again. It's time to prosper. It's time to win. It's time for a season of jubilee and it gets better. In verse 3 it says this, and this is really what's been stirring my heart for six, seven months. I'm pushing into this this year. It says this, and they will be called oaks of righteousness. <laughs> A planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. He says, and they, that's you, that's me, and we will be called oaks of righteousness. Planted by the Lord for the display, 
for the display. That's what I want to become. I want to become a display for his splendor, for his glory, for his honor. That's what they said. They are coming. The spirit of the sovereign Lord has come. Not just to kind of help you get out of some darkness. To make you something that you're not. To make you an oak of righteousness. Planted. Planted for his display. Some of you are like, you know what, pastor, I don't feel like an oak. You don't know my problems. Some of you, I know a lot of your problems. Actually, you've told me your problems. So I do know a lot of your problems, to be honest. I've sat, I've sat in my office talking to you about so I know. I know, but you know, I, you don't know what I've gone through. I just feel like a, just a weed blowing. I look at my life and you're talking about oaks of righteousness. That's so far from what I feel like, what I see. You're like, that can't be me. That's gotta be the next person sitting next to me. It's, it's for somebody else's. But you guys understand, who are these? Who are these oaks of righteousness? You're like, I made too many mistakes. I've, I've wasted too much time. You don't know what's gone in my marriages. I'm on my second, third. Let's say it don't matter. Look at who these are. The mighty oaks were the ones who were poor. They were the brokenhearted. They're the ones grieving mourning and in despair. God said to those people, he said, hey, and they, not some special other people that didn't have mistakes or didn't have problems. He said, and they will become oaks of righteousness. Like you have no excuse. You don't get to bow out and say, you know what? I'm sorry, pastor. That sounds great, but that's not for me. No, that's for you. That's for me, regardless of what you've done in your life. That's what the spirit of the sovereign Lord comes to create. I was thinking about this. And I was thinking about David's mighty men. You guys have read about David's mighty men? Man, they had such exploits. I think of Benaiah. You guys know him? He found himself in a pit on a snowy day with a little lion. And he won. <laughs> he also killed a powerful Egyptian man with his own spear. There was Abishai, I don't know if I'm saying all these. He killed 300 men with a spear. That's a lot of people with one spear. All right. And not to be outdone, Joseph, he's like, he killed 800 men in one battle with a spear. Like we can see it like maybe a machine gun. No, this is a spear. He had to, he had to physically 800 times at least, right? Mighty. Eleazar, it says this. He stayed on the battlefield when the warriors fled. I mean, that's just a man right there. All the, all the other warriors, all your comrades, they flee. And he stays. And he fights against the Philistines. And he fights so hard. And so long, it said that his hand got clenched. It froze to his sword. I'm not the man. And he did it. And he won. You got others. We read, I always like this story. Talk about those three guys that when David said, I want to drink a water from the well. They're like, oh, we'll go do it. We'll go do it. We'll go get it. We'll go through the enemy lines. We'll get that water. And we read about these great mighty men. You're like, oh. They must have been just these wonderful, glowing, they just must have had something around, this halo around them. They must have been these just amazing people, something that I could never become, but they're just so far over here. But the truth of the matter is, you read in 1 Samuel 22, verse 2, it says this. David found himself in the cave of Adullam. And here's a description of these great exploits, these great men that we marvel at. It says, all those who are in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around David. And he became their leader. About 400 men were with him. Who do you think became those mighty men that won all those battles? They were the outcasts. 
They were distressed. Uh, they probably had all kinds of problems and mistakes. They somehow just found themselves like, I don't know what to do with my life. I'm going to go to that cave with that one guy. <laughs> In debt, discontented, upset. Probably think my life is nothing. My life is over. I'm middle age, going through middle age crises or something like that. I'm just go. Oh, you're here too. If foreigner, we're just we're in this cave, hiding out. This guy who's hiding, and that's going to be our fearless leader, I guess. Four hundred. But the spirit of God. The spirit of God. The spirit of God came upon these type of guys, and made them mighty. And made them mighty. So you realize, who are these mighty oaks of righteousness? Who are they? The brokenhearted, the slaves, the captives, the prisoners, the ones in despair. Some of this might be, some. you feel like this, you just feel like nothing, your life's just become nothing but ashes. But he said, you know what? It's the people that feel that way. He wants to come and make you mighty. Make you mighty, make you something that you are not. That was such a powerful sermon, by the way, Pastor Steve. If you didn't hear last week, you need to, you need to listen to it. I, I'm sincerely, I'm not just saying that to congratulate him on a great sermon. You really should listen to it. In fact, I'm trying to condense it. I'm going to rip it off, re-preach it to myself in a 30-minute like, little thing. And if anyone wants to get any mentoring from me, I'm just going to say, well, listen to this first, and then I'll talk to you. I told Pastor Steve down there, I said, the only problem with your message last week is I have to preach after it. <laughs> That's the only problem with that mess. I got to preach right after. That's not good. So who are these people, these mighty oaks? And what will they do? What will they look like? And it goes on in verse 4. It says this. They will rebuild the ancient ruins. It's like, what am I supposed to do with my life now that this mighty oak, got the Spirit of God on me? So they will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. And you will be called priests of the Lord. You'll be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of the nations. And in their riches you will boast. Listen to this. Instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion. Instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. And so you inherit a double portion in the land, and everlasting joy will be yours. As I look at the mighty oaks, I see a couple things. They're going to receive some things, and they're going to rebuild some things. And some of you need to receive some things. I like this. They received a new name. They said, you'll become priests of the Lord, ministers of our God. Some of you are like, I don't feel like a priest or a minister. Well, you are. You are. And this is a word, we were, Pastor Steve, a couple of weeks ago, we are talking privately and just talking about our generation, the generation below us and, and what shame just sits for no reason. But the people feel shame. They feel disgrace. And maybe it's, maybe it's something they did. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's just a feeling. But whatever that shame is, whatever that stuff that's trying to sit on, he said, listen, instead of shame, instead of disgrace, there is an inheritance. There is an identity that you can, a double portion of something from the Lord that you can remove that, that thing that's trying to plague your life, that's trying to, try to keep you pushed down. So you can never rise up as a mighty oak that's just want to keep you low and a loser and thinking like that about yourself and say, I can't never be this. I can never rise up from this. I've done too much. Listen, he says, instead of that shame, instead of the disgrace, you shall receive a double portion of this inheritance from the kingdom of God. Some of you got to stop acting like a second-class citizen. Stop acting like it. Stop acting like a second-class citizen. Listen, you're not a Raiders fan. My bad. It's, I got three Raiders fans on me that they're just looking at me like I'm going to come up there and punch you in the face. 
It's all in fun. It's all in fun. <laughs> but to receive this inheritance, to understand that you've been called to win, to call to be mighty, whatever's trying to keep you down, whatever's trying to keep shame on your life and disgrace on your life, you don't have to. You don't have to. I'm here to proclaim that. I'm here to declare that. I'm here to preach that to you this morning. And then it says, and they will rebuild some things. It says the ancient ruins, these old ancient things have been long, been sitting in devastation. And I begin to think about that. As I was praying this week, some things as ancient ruins, ancient places, ancient paths that have been de devastated and laying in ruins. And I believe that God wants to have these mighty oaks, us, be rebuilt. And I was thinking of an old ancient path, an old ancient highway that I believe in this generation needs to rise up and begin to rebuild. And we find this old ancient path in Isaiah 35, verse 8. It says this, and a highway or a path will be there. And it is called the highway of holiness. Nothing better than the oaks of righteousness to help rebuild something that in my opinion, particularly in the American church, and maybe for a couple of generations, this highway, this path, this ancient path, I believe has been laying in ruins. And it don't matter, not just the congregation, but in leaders, pastors, this path has not been preached enough or have not been lived enough. And I believe that we are being called to rebuild some ancient paths that have been laying in ruins. It says, and there will be a highway of holiness. And I was thinking about Luke 3, 4. It says, a voice in the wilderness. You wrote a song about it, Pastor Eric, right? A voice of one crying out. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places made smooth. That is what our generation needs. That is what the church needs. That we have somebody, and it's going to be unlikely people. I, my, such a dream that the millennials or the Gen Z who have gotten a bad rap about a hundred different things. The generation looking at them, they're not this, they're not that. Although they are the fruit of all of us. And it's the fruit of our churches. But what would it be like, the most unlikely ones, the ones that made all kinds of mistakes, there hasn't even been a hint of this in their life. What would it be like, oh God, it's a dream of mine. That they would be the ones to say, you know what? I see that's laying in ruins. We haven't been walking on it. We haven't seen it. But we are going to be the ones who help rebuild this highway. We're going to rebuild this highway of holiness. And I want to talk just a little bit real quick here. What that might look like. It goes on and says, talk about this highway. It says, it will be for those who walk on the way. The unclean will not journey on it. Fools will not go about it. No lion will be there or ravenous beast. They will not be found there, but only the redeemed will walk there. And the, those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing, and everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. What does this highway look like? Well, first of all, it's a place of holiness. I mean, it's right in the name. All right? It's a place of holiness. It's a place for the oaks of righteousness. It's a place where the winners hang out. Not losers. All right? Not the unclean. And I want to give some hope because some of you are like, I've been losing. 
and I've been kind of acting a fool. And there's other versions of the other translations that that line is significantly different, and it may be some good news for some of you. <laughs> some of you are like, yeah, I've, been, I've lost, I've made mistakes, I've acted a fool once or twice, and you know what? There's a lot that's maybe not unclean about my life. Well, here's, here's something powerful. In the New King James Version, it says this. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not go astray. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I've been a fool a lot. That gives me a lot of hope. It says this, although a fool, if they can get on this road and walk in it, although a fool, they shall not go astray. What does that tell me? If we could just get this road built, and if you are struggling, if you could just find yourself on the road, if you could just get yourself on the road, you will not go astray, you won't lose your way. You gotta get on there. And listen, that's good news for some of you. But you know what? It's powerful. Some of you have been walking in this way. You've been walking on the road. I wanna challenge you. As a church, as a place, we gotta rebuild this highway. Why? Because there's a lot of people out there. Yeah, their life's a mess. What do you expect? They're so far from this road. But even if they walk through those doors and they've been foolish, they've made lots of mistakes. If they can just get on the road, they can just get in the place, they can make it. And a lot of people that need to make it. Oh, and the love for just people should say, you know, we gotta build this. We gotta build a church that has this, right? says the unclean or the uncircumcised, other translation says, that how are we going to get this highway? How are we going to start to rebuild this? Obviously, we got to have this highway of holiness, which I just speak to as like a, his holy presence filling. It's a highway of his presence. It's a highway of holy God's presence. His holy presence. Listen, you can't get holy without holy God. All you don't have is religion. If you don't have holy God, in his presence, and you try to build a highway of holiness, you're going to get really bad religion. None of us want that. Right? None of us, right? It's not good. But we need to have holy presence of God, a highway, where when people step in here, they can experience something of God and have a chance. Have a chance. Getting around something that's not of this world so they can become something not of this world. But guess what? It doesn't say God's going to prepare the way for the Lord. It says you prepare the way of the Lord. Build this thing. Build this thing. The unclean won't be found there. What are we going to do to get ourselves in position? Listen, we need to be people that allow the circumcision of God's word to continue to work in our lives. We need his word to prick our hearts again, right? That circumcision means to cut away. Where you're allowing the word of God to come in and begin to cut away all the garbage, all the junk in our lives. This is how we're going to get in position. We can't stand up against it. I like in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, it says this. The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. I was thinking about this, what we need. And I got a picture. This actually happened this morning. I was praying this morning. I went out in my car just to pray because everyone was sleeping in my house. And uh, I was thinking about this circumcision of our heart. And we always think of like that hard heart callous heart, and there's probably some people that that's probably true, you need God's word to come in and soften that and, and cut that out, but as I just looking at the body of Christ, and maybe us here and myself, 
I felt, I just saw a picture of like a stake that had like really thick marbling around it. And I felt like the Lord says, it's not necessarily hardness of the heart and the body of Christ. It's just that you guys have just gotten so fat. Like not physically, but like, there's just a fatness that needs to be cut away. It's, it's caused you guys to be lethargic, apathetic, dull, lazy. And it needs to be, it's not even that you're hard-hearted towards me. It's just you've, you've just grown fat in, in some things. And I believe the Spirit of the Lord throughout us, if we're going to be in position to help rebuild and become these mighty oaks, we got to allow that Spirit of God to begin to cut away all this stuff. That's what a place of holiness. I know we have some young adults who are fasting right now. Why they pick the time when they're going to have a Super Bowl, I don't know, but that's what you guys did. So glory to God. Thank you, Sean. Come in on it with you. So, uh, But what is fasting? It's a cutting away of things, right, that get in your way. It's making room. If we're going to have this highway, all of you got to begin to make room for God. A place of intimacy, a place of his presence, a place of first love. That's what he's calling you to become and help rebuild in our church. What I like about this highway too, this is even going to be more important for so many people in our world. This is why we have to rebuild this. It's a place of safety and peace. It says no lion will be there or any ravenous beast will not be found there, but only the redeemed will walk there. Those that the Lord has rescued. If we can rebuild this church, it's going to be a place of peace and safety. When it might look like all hell's breaking loose around us. It's a place of holiness, a place of highway. It's a church that have taken this serious. You see, you no, know, I am a mighty oak. I might not feel like it, but I am a mighty oak, and I've been called to rebuild some things. I'm called to rebuild this highway. It's a place of safety and peace. It's a place, this is some good news for some of you too, it's a place of joy. I love this. It says this. So you know that I bring safety, peace, and joy in it because your religion sometimes says those can't go along with the path of holiness. How many of you understand that, right, what I'm talking about? When I say the highway of holiness, does your first thing that comes in your mind is, oh, that's going to be a place of peace and joy. No, we have, our religion shows up, right? Oh, that means I'm done wearing makeup, I got to wear my hair in a bun, right? Or whatever. Or I, I got to stop doing this or just real heavy. It's a place of joy, it's a place of peace. Look at what it says. It says this. They will enter Zion with singing and everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will do what? Overtake them. I want to build this. I like being overtaken by joy and gladness. I, I'd rather have that than whatever else is floating around this world. I want to be overtaken. I was, they'd probably be embarrassed, but last night, um, Isaac and Aubrey came home. And we had a little party because Isaac put a big old ring on Miss Aubrey's last night. You won, son. You got a yes. Congratulations. So newly engaged uh, couple over there. But what I, what I was thinking about is she came in and she was just, she was smiling a lot, looking at her ring. And, and, she, goes, and she said to me, she goes, my face hurts from smiling so much. And that's to me a great picture of being overtaken with joy and gladness, right? That's getting tired of being so happy that your face is getting so I want that, right? I want that. I want to be a place where I'm overtaken. But it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Unless we are the people of God who say, no, I'm going to rebuild that old ancient path. It don't happen. Unless we begin to rebuild this highway of holiness that we are called to be oaks of righteousness. Every single one of us. Even you watching from your home. Stand up and say hi. <laughs> We're called to this. To rebuild something. And I want to end with this. Band, you can come out and get in your place. You're hiding back there anyway. Just come on out. <laughs> I 
This last week and a half, I was praying, I felt like I got a prophetic word uh, from Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16, and from the NIV translation, I believe this is a word for us, a word from God. It says this, this is what the Lord says, stand at the crossroads and look. I'm going to stop right there. I believe that is a prophetic word for our nation, for the body of Christ, for our church, for us as individuals. I believe right now in the history of time we are at a crossroads. And here the, it says that the Lord says, stand at the crossroads and look. It means open your eyes. Get rid of the veils. Get rid of the blinders. We are standing at the crossroads of our lives. Some of you personally are at a crossroads. Which direction will you go? Which path will you choose? Will you say, you know, I will become an oak of righteousness or I will just settle into this mediocre religious thing that settles and gets real used to just losing? Which path? He said, Stand at the crossroads and look. If I could just say that, I wanted to say that, not to you guys, but to the spirit realm over our nation. Stand at the crossroads and look. Look. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. And it goes on and says this. And ask for the ancient paths. Asked where the good way is. That's what I've been preaching today. We're at a crossroads, and maybe you are in your own life. But you need to stand there, you need to open up your eyes, you need to look, and you need to begin to ask for that ancient path. I talked about one today. Ask, what is the good way? And some of you, we just got to choose. We want the way of the world, a way of the kingdom. We want that wide, wide path, or we're going to choose a narrow road that he called us to. Do we want to just stay the broken, down and out losers, or do we want to allow the Spirit of God to come upon us and make us something we're not? To make us oaks, once again, planted by God. He said, hey, you're at a crossroads. You need to look, you need to ask. Ask, show us God, what this ancient path, what it looks like, what does the lifestyle of this highway look like? Ask where the good way is. And I like this, it says this, and walk in it. And walk in it. Some of you, I'm looking at Mighty Oaks right now. I'm looking at mighty oaks of righteousness. Spirit of God, the rebuilders of that ancient path. To ask for the good way and begin to walk in it, church. Walk in it. Walk in it. This is who you are. You guys are oaks of righteousness. You guys are winners. Right? But you got to start to walk in it. You got to expect it. You got to believe it. Some of you got to demand it of your life. You have a choice. Some of you at different ages, you could just coast into the sunset of your life. Some of you are younger, you're like, I don't want to be bothered by all that quite yet. But no matter where you're at, I believe it. I believe prophetically. As a nation, as a church, and as individuals, we are at a crossroads. And we need to begin to ask, show us God, show us God. And we need to begin to walk in it. I like this. This is such a great promise. If we will do this, it says this, and you will find rest for your souls. 
Let me just give you this word again for you. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. We can go ahead and stand up here. This morning I wanted to declare that the favor of the Lord is upon you. The goodness of God, I want to declare victory for your life. Who can say, hey, Pastor, I believe he's calling us to become oaks of righteousness. Is there anybody here that say, you know what, I want to help rebuild. I want to help rebuild that kind of a church. Is there anyone here that say, you know what, I'm here and I want to restore, I want to renew a highway of holiness in my life. I want to help rebuild it for a whole generation, a whole nation. Are there people here who say, you know what? I agree, we are at a crossroads. We are at a crossroads in our nation. And it's time for us to rise up and become oaks, oaks of righteousness. I'm going to have our prayer warriors come up here. And prayer words, I need you to do something really, something for me here. I need you guys to be very, I mean, I know you guys are always like this, but especially today, I need you very discerning and sensitive. Because there are people here that need to have some things cut away. And then there's going to be some people that will come down here, they need to have some shame and disgrace removed from their life. And you got to know whether to pour something into them or cut something off of them, okay? But today, I'm going to pray for all of us. It's a great day. Let's hope for a great evening, right? But listen, I like this. Because regardless of today, I might look at a bunch of champions on a TV, but I don't have to pretend like I'm one of those. I'm actually not going to win anything today. Hate to break the news to you guys. You are personally not going to win anything. You are watching. You are doing nothing, okay? So today, when you're shouting, hopefully our whole, when we're hearing the guns going off in our city, hopefully today, it's gonna be wonderful. We're gonna rejoice. But I wanna remind you, you personally have won zero. They're not asking you to be in that parade. So don't get your artificial win fix from somebody else's life. When you be called to become the mighty oaks, you be called to win. You be called to be the head. And it's time for you to take, church, it's time for you to take your rightful position. Amen? So it's going to be a beautiful time, but I'm going to pray over all of us. And if you want to respond to this, and maybe allow God to just work this in you a little bit more, do that, and then you're free to go. We'll be back here next week. So, Father, we thank you so much right now. God, we receive this word today. God, we receive that prophetic unction of the declaration of that victory and the favor and that season of jubilee. We receive that right now. Come and receive that right now. And Father, I pray for them right now that you would begin to move in their life. That you begin to create oaks of righteousness in this church. God, that you would stir them on the inside. That they would begin to rebuild that ancient path. God, let them receive their inheritance today. I remove every bit of shame, every bit of disgrace off your life. Listen, I declare, all of you, that you are blessed, that you have the favor, and that you are oaks of righteousness. Amen. Amen.